Uh, I thank you, Lord, for this time that we can worship you and this time that we can uh, dive into your word. And I pray, Lord, that, uh, that even when technology doesn't work, even when things kind of get messed up, at the same time, Lord, that your spirit would speak to us and that we would be impacted and changed through your word and through who you are and through what that means for each and every one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, well, happy new year. Let's try that. All right, it's great to be back. Uh, I missed the, the historic thunder snow here in, in, in Little Rock, Arkansas, and I'm so bummed. But we were jetting out of here as fast as we could on Christmas Day to try to get up in front of it. And we headed home for the first time in seven years for Christmas. And there is something that happens when you make that 1,900-mile trip to Iowa and to Minnesota and to the frozen tundra, um, what you all of a sudden realize is it kind of brings you home in a sense. You, you look at pictures of Christmas past, you talk about memories and everything, but this year it was not only different because we were finally home, it was different because of my dad. Now you have to understand, my dad had all of us in the room and he had us sit down, that's not a good thing. Then he stood up and he started his presentation, which is not a good thing. See, he's a pastor, and it's rough being a pastor's kid, let me tell you. Yeah, my poor kids, they, they have no, no help in the future. But anyway, he gets up and he starts in on this, this presentation. I find out that his new hobby is Ancestry.com. Yes, he has done months of research and he is about to tell us all about it. So he hauls out all of these sheets of, of family trees and pictures of the boat of my, my great-grandmother who came over and, and all these other, like, details. And it's amazing the things he found. He was able to trace our history back um, almost to the time of Luther in a number of places in Germany. Pretty amazing. And, and what we found is that... <laughs> There are certain people in my family that are really honorable and, and incredible that I'm like proud to be a part of, and there are certain people we would like to not own. But they are all a part of my history, of me, of my beginnings. Well, the next six weeks, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be doing a little research of our own. We are going to be diving into our history to see our beginnings, and, and we're going to look at our story, to, and that's going to help us to see how we've gotten to where we are. Now, before you, you take too much of a, a leap, you have to understand, just like the fact that my great-grandfather on the one side was a missionary in Australia, and my great-grandfather on the other side was a criminal who ended up face down in a lagoon in Chicago, uh, doesn't completely define and determine who I am, all right? But at the same time, it impacts who I am, and it impacts my journey thus far. And so the same is true with you and I as we look into our past collectively and see our beginnings, what we're going to see is it, it does impact to some degree who we are and definitely our journey thus far. And so this morning as we begin this, we are going to go to the very beginning. So if you've got a Bible, pull it out and let's turn to Genesis chapter 1. If you've got a smartphone, you can head to the website on the screen. It's not on the screen. You can head to that anyway. It's in your worship folder where you can follow along, uh, take notes, and so much more. There's even a QR code on your worship folder for that. Um, and that should work, supposedly. All right. We're going to be in Genesis 1, starting in verse 1. You know, let's just uh, pick it up there. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And it goes on, and it says, um, God spoke, and boom, all of a sudden there was land, and there was, the seas were all contained. God spoke, and boom, all of a sudden there was, there was trees and vegetation all around. And God spoke, and there was... There was fish in the sea and birds in the air. There was, um, there was animals of all kind. And then we go, get to verse 26. And God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. And he spoke, 
and he was there. In verse 31, then God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. And so in six short days, God spoke all of creation as complex and as majestic, majestic as it is all into existence. And that's our beginnings. And as you hear that story, as you think of a God that can speak and bam, it happens. As you drive through the mountains, I guess you call them mountains, in Fayetteville, which I did on the way back from Minnesota, and see the beauty there. As you watch and see the snow come down and the ice glisten in the sun on your trees before they take out the power for a whole week. Um, as you look at, uh, at the Grand Canyon and visit there, or as you, you watch a newborn, well, as you see a newborn after they've been born, as you look at pictures of this world that we live in from outer space, what does it do to you? I mean, really, what does it do to you? Does it leave you in awe? In awe of a God that is so big and so strong that he can make all that? A God that can make something so perfect that it's so complex and balanced, so amazing? Or do you get to the point of going, nah, I don't know. You know, what, what about the, the, the fossils that are millions of years old? Or what about, what about the Neanderthals? You know, they're not just on the commercials. They're real, right, in the past? What about the dinosaurs? You know, what, what about, nah, I just don't, I don't know about six days. Well, often this beginnings thing is kind of a huge hang-up for, for many people. And, and so a lot of times churches, they try to kind of avoid it, not deal with it. Other people try to avoid it, not deal with it. And they think, well, you know, does it really matter what you believe? Because can't we just stay in the New Testament, talk about Jesus and disciples and forgiveness and all that stuff? We don't need to dive too far into the past, right? Because it seems a bit like a tall tale. And if I believe in it, doesn't it kind of make me seem like I'm a bit naive? And yet there are some circles where this is incredibly popular. It's an incredible popular debate, especially this whole creation evolution debate, right? And, and there's some people that they just gravitate to them. They may, maybe you're one of them. Maybe you're wired in that way where you just like nature and neurons and um, are they, they called neurons? I don't know. Uh, or, or Star Trek. Maybe you like Star Trek, right? And, and you're just wired that way. And so when you read through the Bible, all of a sudden you get to something like this and you're like, huh, I wonder. Or, or maybe you have kids in certain schools where, where old earth evolution is taught like it's gospel, like it's true. Or, or I have actually some friends here this morning from, from Houston. And back in Houston, there's a ton of people back there that are in gas and oil where they live in this reality at least five days a week where, where rocks and soil and everything else is billions of years old. And that's a given. And the question of God being even there is not a given. And yet many people, then they, they feel kind of stuck in this debate between seemingly two opposing viewpoints. You know, the, they tend to think that either you see the world through science or you see the world through Scripture. And if you see it through Scripture, that means you're a devout, faithful follower of Jesus. And if you see it through science, that means you're normal <laughs> or intelligent or something. But the truth is, science and Scripture aren't at odds. Even though it's, it can be common to believe today that there's this war going on between religion and science, it's, it's not true. I mean, we, we get wrapped up into it as we listen to the debate on whether evolution should even be taught in schools or, or stem cell research. We, we debate that on a religious grounds. And, and it gets to this point where you can see that, that science or think that science and faith, and faith are two opposite ends of the spectrum where you can either be scientific and, and rational or you can be religious, where you can think that, that once you believe in Jesus, you have to buy into an unscientific, uneducated viewpoint of the world. And yet that's just not true. See, science and scripture aren't at odds. In fact, I believe that science is, is a great evidence. It's a great testimony 
to making this upholding scripture. In fact, if you look at Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 1, verse 20, Paul makes this claim. He says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from, from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. What that basically means is that if you look at, at creation, if you look at life itself around you, if you look at everything around you, it's incredible evidence of a God that has created a masterpiece out of nothing. It's overwhelming evidence against chance in supporting this, what I believe. And see, this is not a science book. It doesn't claim to be. But this is a truthful, inspired, inerrant book. And yet, why then this disconnect between the two camps? Why is science and scripture labeled as, as polar opposites? Well, at first, I, I think it's important that we understand that, that any theory of the beginnings of all things is a faith-based theory. So if you come up with a theory based on so-called science or so-called the Bible or scripture or on your imagination, it's based out of faith, not fact. That's the truth. Let me explain. If we piled all the evidence of this world on a table, all the books, a huge table up here, we had the books and studies of, of Darwin, of Stephen J. Goud, of, of Cornelius Hunter, of all these different people, and, and all of the people, all the scientists on the creationist uh, side of things were to look at it, and all the professors from an evolutionary kind of background were to shift through it, and what they would find as they go through all the geological studies, as they would look at all the, the dissertations, as they would look at the dinosaur bones and the fossil uh, studies and carbon dating and so on and so forth, what they would find is that as they shift through that, both sides would come to this conclusion that it, it all makes sense to me. What they would all find is that they would believe that they are completely and totally right. Because they're entrenched in their position. Because the reality is both evolution and creationism are faith-based propositions. And, and evolution might say, no, it's from science, but... But the reality is it's, it's based on faith. And, and the reason is, is because you can't repeat or test or measure any of it. You can't rewind to the beginning of time and, and observe something by God made poof out of nothing. It just won't happen. You can't you know, go all the way back and, and have science repeat on a macro scale what evolution claims where the stars just align just right, and by chance a molecule is made, which by chance slowly becomes a living being, which by chance ends up being a salmon that goes up the, the river, <laughs> or eventually a, a golden retriever or a human. It doesn't work that way. See, science by definition is what is observable, repeatable, and falsifiable. And with that definition, that means that creationism is not science. But old earth evolution is not science either. And, and so this debate is not uh, a debate between science and religion. No, it's a debate on the evidence for evolution, old earth evolution, and the evidence for a God that has created everything. And amazingly, both science and faith play big parts in both sides. See, the reason that both creationists and evolutionists are, are encamped in their positions is because they come to, their, to the table with certain presuppositions. The big difference is if, if God is involved and engaged or if there's no God or at least there's no God that's, that's active. And, and those presuppositions are like putting on different types of glasses. And, and, and as you put those glasses on, they make certain things clear and other things fuzzy. And so a scientist who believes in creationism and they look at life, they put on the glasses of Scripture. And they look at life at, from the perspective that we have a God that is strong and loving, that has made all things. And yet, somebody who comes from evolution, they look at this as if this is the National Enquirer. 
What do you do when you go through the, the, the checkout line at a store and see the National Enquirer? You look at those things that aliens have come, and, and what do you think? It's a hoax, right? And, and you kind of read through it to, for, for you know, great uh, taglines and great headlines, but you throw it all out as a hoax. And that's basically what those scientists do. They look at this and they say, it's anything but this. And they throw this out and they embrace the theories of men that take just as much faith to believe in. Now with everything um, in life, there's this wide array of views and theories on the origins of all things and the age of the earth. And it, it, it varies from on this far end, there's a six-day literal creation account, biblical account. And on this far end, there's this atheistic evolution um, uh, creation of the world account, okay? Uh, so there's, two, there's a major, major uh, uh, spectrum, and in there, there's all kinds of different ideas. So there are some that, that read Genesis 1-1, and they, they, they read that, and they, they think of, well, they believe in historic creationism. And that is that Genesis 1-1 happened, and God created the earth, and then he, he left it for millions or maybe billions of years, and then he moved on to the rest of the account. And there's people over here on evolution, they say, no, there must be a God because something had to start all this, but then he walked away, and then he let the earth create and form itself. So there's all kinds of different ideas, and yet... I, can I just say, I, I want to warn you, because there's a slippery slope to start, as faithful followers of Jesus, uh, of discounting Genesis. And it's not that you have to be this hardline six-day creationist to be saved, because salvation is found in what? In believing in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, not in believing in Genesis 1. But the problem is, is the more we walk away from Genesis, the more we have to face major, enormous issues in our faith, and in our life. In fact, let's look at some of these implications of junking Genesis and junking our beginnings, how we have started. The first is with Scripture. If, if we say, yeah, I do the Bible, but I don't do Genesis, all of a sudden that starts to create a very low view of what God's Word is. All of a sudden we start going through, I like this, but I don't like that. I'll buy this, I don't buy that. And, and that attitude robs us of having any kind of authority in our life. And so all of a sudden it, it doesn't have the kind of authority that, that God's word says it's supposed to. Look at what it says in 2 Timothy chapter 3. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So in other words, every section of this is written by the creator of all things, so that as we enter into our world and look at things and, and, and interact with things and, and want to know how to, to react to things, it's there for us. But if we discount the creation story, it starts to get in the way of that. It can also impact our, our theology. Theology uh, is just our way of looking at God. That's what theology, th theology means. It's how one looks at God. And, and so if I step back and I see God as one who lets things happen recklessly and randomly, all of a sudden my view of God can shift pretty quick and slide even to the point of, well, this is the American National Association of Biology Teachers statement. They said, the diversity of life on earth is an outcome of evolution, an unsupervised, impersonal, unpredictable, natural process of temporal descent with genetic modification that is affected by natural selection, chance, historical contingencies, and changing environments. Wow. Impersonal, unsupervised, unpredictable. Translation, no creator, totally random, where we get a single molecule coming to become a full-fledged Dan Hauser. Something went wrong somewhere in there. But if I believe this is God's word and that it's true, I, I see a God that created the sunset and the mountains and the stars and my kids. 
I, I see a, a God that was intentional on creating a world so amazing that it can, it can take care of itself and it can give us all that we need. I see a God that was so amazing that, that creates an incredible creation that, that testifies to him as God and as good. If you call into question our beginnings, it starts to, to eat away at our definition of what sin and death is. See, in evolution, sin is something that we are working to evolve out of, and death is actually a good thing. It's, it's the way of getting rid of the weak and the flawed. And so the hypothesis would be that as the years go by, mankind would be more healthy, more kind, more loving, more moral. How's that working out? Yeah. And yet by Genesis 3, all of a sudden we see sin come into the world. It's a selfishness, it's self-centeredness, it's us trying to be God, wanting to be in control. And the result of that is death, and death is not a good thing. It's not God's design. It's, it's the curse of our rebellion. And so sin and death is what Jesus came to fix. He came to fix this mess in this world that we have created, a brokenness of relationships with God and with other people, of our bodies that... We'll be praying for it in a little bit of people whose bodies are decaying, not improving. First Corinthians says this, for since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in, as in Adam, all die, and so in Christ, all will be made alive. Mankind, or this world left to itself, only leads to chaos and hurt and ultimately death. See, only God can give life. Only God can give hope. Only God can bring forgiveness and restoration to this world and to our past, to our relationships. Only God, by taking our place, by dying our death, by, by his son Jesus Christ, dying on the cross for your, for your sins and mine. Junking our beginnings in Genesis has an implication on logic. Mankind has this natural instinct to be inquisitive, to, to seek answers to questions, to put their trust and their faith into something. And, and yet the logic of evolution just doesn't add up. Uh, out of the millions of fossils that have been found, none of them have been found that are, go, are in transition. Not a one. Not, not a one that's going from a fish to a reptile or a reptile to a bird or, or an ape to a to human. Not a one. And, and then this whole idea that it just happens by chance. Well, there's this, this guy, um, Dr. James Kopej, a, a, an expert in science of statistical probability. Not my career. Uh, he calculated the chance of forming just one single protein molecule within millions of years, and it's 1 in 10 to the 161st. That's, that's 10 with 161 zeros after it. There's a second theory of... of um, Oh, man, I get this. Second, law of thermodynamics, which is entropy. You probably have heard of that, as some of you might have. This whole idea that things generally run from order to disorder, from, from, from good to bad to decay. And yet there is this other theory called evolution that's totally the opposite. That things in random and in chance and in time re lead to beauty and order. It doesn't add up. And, and so in the end, the real question is, is how big is your God? I mean, think about it. How big is your God? Here's what I think. Here's what I believe. My God is big enough to snap his fingers and it happens. To say, let there be light and light happen. He didn't have to wait millions of years for the light to come. It was like flipping a switch on. My God is big enough to speak and all of a sudden land is formed and seas are contained. My God is big enough to make this earth in a way that is amazing, that is instantly old, that can take care of itself, that, that provide everything that we need. My God is big enough to speak and all of a sudden there are animals of all kinds. My God's big enough to speak and there was humans. My God is big enough to become, uh, become flesh and speak 
and water be turned to wine, and, and two fish and, and uh, five loaves become food for thousands of people. My God is big enough to make something incredible like the mind in a way that we can mostly explain in textbooks, but he's also big enough to be able to fill in the gaps for the things we don't understand and, and can't explain. My God is big enough not only to make something out of nothing, but also to fix the things that are broken. To fix a world that is totally messed up. To heal the incurable. To bring the dead back to life. Psalms says this. It says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. And, and when we all of a sudden open up our eyes and see the miracles around us, there's billions of miracles around us. And, and when we open up this and we look at our beginnings, it all of a sudden helps us to grasp our reality of who we are. And our reality is this. We were made by a powerful God who could speak and it happened. We were made by an amazing God who all you have to do is look up into the sky on a dark, clear night and see the masterpiece that will take your breath away. Or drive through the mountains on a fall day or, 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 or see a newborn baby. And, and you say, it can't be by chance. Our reality is that we were made by a, a creative God. My kids like watch this show called Wild Kratts. And it's amazing, all these facts about these, these animals, how God made them incredible. And then we look at one another, and there's not a one of us alike, thank goodness, right? And God has made us unique and special of gifts and talents and personalities our reality is that we were made by a loving God, that even when we messed up his creation, he still sent his son, Jesus, to save it. And even when some of us, we open this up and we read his, the creator's account and we question his power and we question his word and we question the story, he still loves us. He still pursues us still forgives us. When we turn to our beginning, what we find is that we have a God that is not only our creator, but he's our sustainer. He takes care of us. And he's our savior. And all we have to do is look at the creation around us, and it testifies to the fact that we have a world that is amazing, that only a God that is powerful enough to create something out of nothing can explain it. Otherwise, it's not explainable. My prayer is, is that you would rest in the promise that, that our God is that great. He's that powerful that he can create out of nothing. May you have peace that he's not only active in the world many years ago when he created, but he's also active in your life today. And may you have hope of knowing that our God is big enough to overcome any of the stuff in your life any of the diseases that rid our bodies. May we know that he loved us enough to send his son Jesus Christ to build a bridge back to reconcile you and me and all creation, his creation, to him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God that is living and active in our life. We thank you for, this, for the account of our beginnings, how it shows your majesty, how it points us to the amazing things that you have created all around us. Lord, help us to, to see those things as a reminder, as a thing, that, uh, uh, as, a, as evidence of the fact that you are God, you are good, you are powerful. Lord, help us to be reminded each and every day that you loved us enough to not only create us, not only take care of us, but to save us through your son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.